Tell me if this sounds familiar. You get a brand new idea for a cool project, so you immediately start working on it, coding together features, trying to go as quickly as you can, and then you run into some bugs. And you're like, well, I really wanna focus on the features, so I'm just gonna quickly throw together some hacks to fix these bugs and keep working on different features. And then down the line a little ways, you run into some deadlines where you're like, I really need to get this finished. So you start cutting some corners, your code doesn't look as good as it used to. And before you know it, your code is a complete and utter mess. There's bugs everywhere. Changing any feature takes 10 times longer than it should. And you wonder, how did I even get here? It seems like just yesterday, my code was perfect. So you decide, you know what? I'm just gonna scratch all my code. It's useless. I'm gonna rewrite it from scratch and it's gonna be so much better. Fast forward two months and you're in the exact same position you were before and you're wondering how you got there. This is the idea of technical debt. In this video, I'm gonna show you how you can mitigate technical debt, overcome it, and most importantly, avoid it. Welcome back to Web Dev Simplified. My name's Kyle, and my job is to simplify the web for you so you can start building your dream project sooner. So if that sounds interesting, make sure you subscribe to the channel for more videos just like this. Now to get started, before we can dive into the topics of how to mitigate technical debt, and even how you can use technical debt to your advantage, I first want to talk about what technical debt is, because this is actually a topic that a lot of people get wrong when they're describing technical debt. A lot of times people try to reference financial debt and technical debt and compare the two, but really they're a lot more different than people realize, and instead a better example of what technical debt is, is actually comparing technical debt to a library. Now before I dive into that example of using a library, I first want to mention just what technical debt is, and technical debt is really any amount of code that slows down the process of writing code. This could be having poorly written code like really long functions or files. It could be something like having no tests in your application, which makes finding bugs harder. Or it could even be something like having some old jQuery code thrown inside of a React application. That old jQuery code is just slower and harder to work with because it really goes against the rest of your React based application. It could be anything as long as it just slows down the process of development. Now let's talk about that analogy of a library compared to technical debt. A library is great because you can go there, you can find your book because all the books are organized by genre, they're organized by author name, so it's super easy because you walk to the genre you want, you walk to the section alphabetized for that author, and you can find the book incredibly quickly. Now imagine just a giant pile of books and you want to find a single book in that pile. It's going to be hard because there's no organization, you have to wade through thousands of books to find the one you want, and it's going to take you an incredibly long time to find that book. This is essentially a technical debt ridden code base, something that's a disorganized pile of books, while a clean library that's perfectly organized is just like code that doesn't have any technical debt. And the way that technical debt accrues is over time, you're trying to save time. So you're saying, oh, you know what? I don't have time to fix this bug, so I'm just gonna make a really short hacky fix for it, and eventually I'll come back and fix it later. If you do that 10, 20, 30 different times, you're gonna have a lot of technical debt that accrues because you have all these hacky fixes that make working with your code more difficult. Same thing with a library. Let's say you go, you check out a book from the library, you read this book and you go to return it. Instead of putting it back in the location where it belongs, that takes time. You have to re-find the location where it belongs. Instead you say, you know what? I'm just gonna throw it on the shelf anywhere. It doesn't matter. And you do that. Maybe a hundred other people that go to the library do that. And now the library is a little bit disorganized. If you go to try to find that book, it's no longer where you expect it to be. So now it takes you longer when you need to find that book. Same thing with technical debt. If you go and need to change code that has technical debt in it, it's going to take you longer to actually change that code. But luckily, the code that doesn't have any technical debt is still gonna be able to change quickly. The problem though, is that as you have more and more disorganization in your library or your code, it's going to be harder for you to find the books you need or to change the code that you need. So if people are just constantly putting books all over the place in the wrong place all the time, eventually the library is gonna be about the same as a giant pile of random books and your code is gonna be a jumbled mess. This gets even worse because when you want to go and fix technical debt, it almost always is going to take you longer than if you had just done it the right way in the first place. For example, if you have a book and you know where that book needs to go because you know the genre and you know the author's name, it's pretty easy to put it back in the right spot. It takes a little longer than just randomly putting it somewhere, but it's not too long. If now what you have to do is you have to go into your library, you have to find the misplaced book, figure out what genre it is, and then figure out what the author's name is and put it in the right place, that takes much longer because you have to find the book and then you have to find the place that the book goes. You have like two things that you need to do. While in the first example, all you had to do was find the right place because you already had the book in hand. That's the same thing with technical debt. Generally, when it comes to fixing a bug, if you want to fix it the right way the first time, it just takes a little bit longer. Not too much longer, but it'll take a little longer. 
Well, if you have to fix it later on, that code is going to be a little bit messier. Maybe the way that the bug would have worked is unknown to you, so now you have to re-figure out how the bug works and then fix the actual code, so it's going to take you longer to fix. That's why they call it debt usually, because it's something that you save a little bit of time now, but at the expense of a lot of time later. Now, before I continue on with this library example too much further, I want to dive into some techniques for how you can actually mitigate your technical debt. And probably the most common way to mitigate technical debt is just to spend more time. This is the most obvious. If you spend 10 hours writing a feature and then change it and spend 20 hours writing the feature, your code is going to be much better. There's going to be much less technical debt accrued. But obviously, the problem is that you don't always have as much time as you want. If you could spend infinite number of hours working on a feature, then obviously the code is going to be perfect, but nobody has that much time. So usually spending more time is not always going to be the thing that you can do. Maybe you can spend a little bit more time, but generally you don't have the wiggle room because you have deadlines you need to meet, and spending more time is just not an option. Now the next way to manage technical debt is actually to write test along with your code. By writing test with your code, even if your code is a little bit messy, it actually helps make your code better because now you have documentation for the code. This test is essentially documentation where you can read the different test cases and know exactly what the code is supposed to do. So even if the code is hard to read, the test should be easy to read and make it so you can understand the code. Also, if things change in the future, it's really easy to see if you're introducing bugs by having test. I really personally love test and I recommend checking out the video I have in the cards and description down below, which is going to cover the basics of testing for you to get started with if you're unfamiliar. But again, testing has a little bit of a problem that it takes additional time to write these tests. Generally, the time commitment is rather small, especially for how much you're going to be gaining from it. So I always recommend spending the extra time to write the test, even if you spend less time actually designing and writing the code. I think Worse written code with test is better than better written code with no test, just because over time the code is going to change and get modified, so what starts out as really well written code is going to get kind of messy, but if you have tests there, it's going to make sure to help that the code is always going to work, and that there's not going to be problems, and overall it saves you a ton of time. Now this next way to mitigate technical debt is something most people don't really talk about, and it's essentially like the Boy Scout rule, where you leave something better than you found it. And this is essentially the idea of going into code and you're writing some code and you realize some of the code you're changing or code that's nearby what you're working on maybe is a little bit messy. It has bad variable names, bad function names. The code is just kind of like one big function, whatever it is. And you say, you know what? I could rename these variables or I could take this one big function and break it into like three or four smaller functions and the code is going to be better. Or maybe you say, you know what? I could write a few tests for this code that doesn't have tests. Super small things to do. You know, you're making the code 1% better but it doesn't take you much extra time. You're taking five, 10, maybe 15 extra minutes to do this. And overall, you're making the code base better. So by introducing these changes, you're improving the code instead of worsening it. So you're kind of taking away some of the technical debt that you've accrued by just changing things as you see them. You know what, I'm changing this code and this other code that's nearby has some mess to it. I'm gonna spend 15 minutes and clean that up. This is just like as if you were inside of a library and you're going to put the book back that you have into the library and you see another book nearby that's misplaced. If you just grab that book and also put it back where it belongs, it took you, what, one extra minute, two extra minutes, but you made the library so much cleaner. And if everyone does that, eventually the library is just going to make sure it stays at a clean state instead of getting overly messy and turning into a giant pile of books. Now, this final way I want to talk about to mitigate technical debt before we talk into how you can use technical debt to your advantage is actually the most drastic, and that's just doing an entire large refactor. It's kind of like the idea of ripping down all your code and rebuilding it from scratch. Sometimes you just accrue too much technical debt where you get to the point where it's just too difficult to actually make any changes in your code and you need to do a large refactor. This is usually what happens in a lot of companies that have technical debt. They don't manage it and they don't worry about changing it as they go. They just accrue it, accrue it, accrue it until eventually it gets so large they need to pay off all that technical debt at once by dedicating an extreme amount of time, sometimes even months of time, to refactor and rewrite all of the code or large chunks of the code. I generally don't recommend this approach as much Instead, I recommend smaller refactors that you do along the way. So you have the small 1% changes that you make where you can do small things like variable names and function names, but large refactors that take days of time, you can't do in this 1% better scenario. So instead, what you need to do is dedicate either a full day or even like a full sprint of like one or two weeks to do a large refactor or at least a medium-sized refactor where you change some large part of the code that's really messy and try to make it cleaner. And if you do this on a regular basis, it really doesn't slow down your code development for features very much, and it's going to make sure you don't have to eventually shut down and do a huge refactor all at once. If we go back to the library example, think about a library. Every day the library is open, people come in, check out books, check back books, and the library gets messy over time because people are putting them back in the wrong place or they're leaving them out, whatever it is. So then at night, the library closes. 
and people go through the library and they put all the books back where they belong. And then the next day it's open and it's completely clean and ready for people to come in and it closes and repeats this cycle. So the library every day spends a little bit of time putting all the books back where they belong. This is kind of the same idea with these smaller code refactors. Instead of waiting until it becomes too messy, you have to do it all at once. Instead, what you do is just every once in a while, maybe one day in every sprint or one sprint every once in a while, you go through and do a bunch of refactors to keep the code clean and not getting too disorganized. Essentially, in the library example, it'd be as if the library was open 24 hours and never closed and was constantly getting things disorganized over and over and over until eventually nobody could find the books they wanted. So then the library had to shut down for days or even weeks to reorganize everything before opening back up again. Now I'm sure you're probably tired of the library example, so I promise you no more library examples for the rest of the video. And instead, I'm gonna talk about the different ways you can use technical debt to actually make your project better. That may sound crazy, but it's actually true. And obviously the number one way to use technical debt to make the project better is to save time. You can say, you know what, I'm gonna save time by making this feature not as good. Maybe I skip testing or I just don't write the code as clean as I could. So it's going to have some technical debt, but by saving that time, it allows me to hit a really strict deadline or it allows me to add in a more important feature that I need to do like a giant bug that came up. This is something that's really crucial for things that have really hard set deadlines. Think like a video game release, for example. It's really important that you get the video game out on the release day. So maybe the code is going to be a little bit more messy and not quite as good as it should be going up to release because you're trying to get these features out before the game is releasing. But then after release, you have a lot of time where there's not as much time pressure. You can spend that time kind of going back and fixing the technical debt that you accrued up to that point to try to hit that release date. But it is difficult to really balance this time saving though to try to find the right amount of time to work on a feature. Like imagine that you have a feature that you could spend 10 hours on, 20 hours on, or 50 hours. If you spend 10 hours on it, it's not the greatest. The code is kind of messy, there's no test, and it really has a lot of technical debt. If you spend 20 hours, the code is pretty good. It has some tests, but not all the tests you would like. And overall, the code is it's pretty good. It's not bad. It has a little bit of technical debt, though. Or you could spend 50 hours on it, where the code is pretty much perfect. The technical debt is almost minimal. You have all the tests that you want. The code is pretty much as good as it could be. Well, going from 20 hours to 50 hours, you're over doubling the time you spend on it, but you're only increasing the code by, you know, 5, maybe 10%. That's really not a good way to spend your time. While if you're going from 10 hours to 20 hours, you're taking the code from a pretty bad state to a pretty good state, and you're doubling the time, but you're well over doubling the quality of the code. So that is a scenario where it makes a ton of sense to go from 10 hours to 20 hours, spend the extra time, even if the code isn't 100% perfect, and don't worry about getting it all the way to perfection by spending you know 30 extra hours to get to that 50 hour mark. So it's really important to balance how much time can I spend to make my code not too bad, but also where I don't spend too much time where I'm wasting time building this out and making it perfect when really I could have just done it when it's 90% as good as it should be. And that's going to be good enough, especially if you combine this with the tips before where you can, you know, make the code 1% better as you go and also doing some refactors every once in a while. That'll help make up for these areas where you went and cut time by spending 20 hours instead of 50 hours. And it's going to give you the benefit as if you had spent 50 hours on the code, but by only having to spend, you know, 20 hours at a time. So you're saving time while keeping your code quality incredible high. Now the final way that you can actually use technical debt to your advantage is when you have code that is never going to change. Remember at the beginning when I talked about having some jQuery inside of a React application is kind of some technical debt? Well what if that jQuery code is just some old code that you know is never ever going to change? It's just something that is there and it's working as it is and you have no dreams or desires to change it. Well what's the point of refactoring that jQuery code and spending 10-15 hours on it to make it react? When in reality, you're never going to touch that code ever again. The fact that it's jQuery doesn't really matter because you never touch it, you never look at it, you never care about it, it just works as is and that's all that matters. So if you have old code like this that you know really never gets changed, don't worry about it being a technical debt on you. Just leave it as it is, leave it in the older format, don't worry about updating it with the rest of your application and you're gonna save yourself 10, 15 hours that you could spend fixing technical debt in areas where you actually interact with the code all the time. It's going to make your life so much better when you're writing code and it's going to make your application overall much better. Now, if you enjoyed this video, you should definitely check out my blog link down below because that's actually where I got the idea for this video. And I have over a hundred articles on my blog completely for free for you to read related to anything web development. So I highly recommend you check that out. And with that said, thank you very much for watching this video and have a good day.